booster ignition and liftoff of Shuttle Endeavour with NASA's final space station crew compartment that brings a bay window view to our celestial backyard. After Apollo, NASA needed a large program to justify its size and budget. It ambitiously planned a shuttle, a space station, and planetary exploration, but budgetary constraints limited the post-Apollo program to the space shuttle. To secure approval of the shuttle, NASA promised to launch all U.S. payloads. Also the reusable orbiter was presented as a means of long-run cost savings with regularly scheduled, once-per-week operational launches promised by the mid to late 1980s. The shuttle was to pay for itself. To develop 50 shuttle payloads every year, however, would have required a space budget 10 times as large as NASA's actual budget. There was clearly an unrealistic presentation of feasibility on the part of NASA and uncritical thinking on the part of the U.S. Congress. The promises remain a root cause of pressure to launch the shuttle on schedule. The space shuttle fleet is a number of reusable spacecraft that take off like a rocket, orbit Earth like a satellite, and then land like a glider. The space shuttle has been essential to the repair and maintenance of the Hubble Space Telescope and to the construction of the International Space Station. It has also been used for a wide variety of other military, scientific, and commercial missions. It is not capable of flight to the moon or other planets, being designed only to orbit Earth. Two shuttles have been lost in flight. Challenger, which exploded during takeoff on January 28, 1986, and Columbia, which broke apart during re-entry on February 1, 2003. Seven crew members died in each accident. The three remaining shuttles are the Atlantis, the Discovery, and the Endeavour. The first shuttle actually built, the Enterprise, was flown in the atmosphere but was never equipped for space flight. It is now in the collection of the Smithsonian Museum. The first of the two disasters suffered by the shuttle program took place on January 28, 1986, when the external fuel tank of the shuttle Challenger exploded only 73 seconds into the flight. All seven astronauts were killed, including high school teacher Krista McAuliffe, who was flying on the shuttle as part of NASA's public relations campaign Teachers in Space, designed to bolster young people's interest in human space flight. The Challenger disaster prompted a comprehensive study to discover its causes, on June 6, 1986, the Presidential Commission appointed to analyze the disaster published its report. The reason for the disaster, said the Commission, was the failure of an O-ring, a flexible O-shaped ring, in a joint connecting to sections of one of the solid rocket engines. The O-ring ruptured, allowing flames from the rocket's interior to jet out, burning into the external fuel tank and causing it to explode. As a result of the Challenger disaster, many design changes were made. Most of these, 250 for modifications in all, were made in the orbiter, another 30 were made in the solid rocket booster, 13 in the external tank, and 24 in the shuttle's main engine. In addition, an escape system was developed that would allow crew members to abandon a shuttle via parachute in case of emergency, and NASA redesigned its launch abort procedures. The space shuttle Columbia broke up suddenly during re-entry, strewing debris over much of Texas and several other states and killing all seven astronauts on board. Following the disaster, NASA scientists and engineers found that a hole punctured the leading edge of the left wing of Columbia. The hole was made when a piece of insulating foam from the external fuel tank ripped off during the launch. A coating of rigid foam insulation is used to keep the external fuel tank cool. Video cameras recording the Columbia's takeoff show that a piece of this foam broke off about 82 seconds into the flight and burst against the shuttle's wing at some 821 kilometers per hour. Pieces of foam have broken off and struck shuttles during takeoff before, but this was the largest piece ever recorded at least 1 point to kilogram and the size of a briefcase. While Columbia was in orbit NASA engineers, who were aware that the foam strike had occurred, analyzed the possibility that it might have caused significant damage to the shuttle, but decided that it could not have. Computer simulations seemed to show that the brittle tiles covering the shuttle's essential surfaces would not be severely damaged. In any event, there were no contingency procedures to fix any such damage. The shuttle does not carry spare tiles or means to attach them nor does it carry gear that would make a spacewalk to the bottom of the shuttle feasible. NASA officials also insisted that it would not have been possible to fly the shuttle in such a way as to spare the damaged surfaces, as the shuttle's path is already designed to minimize heating on re-entry. However, later, testing revealed that the foam impact on the wing was forceful enough to puncture the wing, with a breach in the protective tiles of the shuttle. 
hot gases entered the interior of Colombia's left wing. During re-entry, the wing began to break up, experiencing greatly increased drag. The autopilot struggled to compensate by firing steering rockets, but could only stabilize the shuttle temporarily. The shuttle's support structure was ultimately destroyed, and the shuttle quickly disintegrated as it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere over the western United States. Similarities between the cases in three areas, no return decisions, misunderstood anomalies, and overridden concerns from engineers, reveal the common ethical issues. No return decisions, in both cases an explicit no return decision left no chance to avoid disaster, for Challenger this occurred at launch specifically, the ignition of the SRBs. For Columbia this came at initiation of re-entry the firing of the retro rockets. Between the identification of an anomaly and this no return decision there was time to have averted the disaster. Misunderstood anomalies, the root cause of both disasters was misunderstanding anomalies. The 2003 Columbia disaster report quotes the 1986 Challenger report to show that the causes were identical. In effect, anomalies in performance if followed by a successful landing were considered evidence of safety instead of what they really were, evidence that the shuttle did not perform as designed. Thus safely landing after foam shedding or seal erosion reinforced the conviction of safety. This normalization of deviance violates the trust given NASA to accomplish human spaceflight safely. Overriding concerns from engineers, in both cases working level engineers most familiar with the relevant systems expressed timely concerns that could have averted the disaster, and their concerns were overridden. Regarding Challenger, Engineers at the SRB contractor wanted to postpone the launch for a few hours or for a day for warmer weather, and were heard by company management in last-minute readiness to launch reviews. But management overrode them after NASA officials expressed frustration and desire to launch. They were overridden in part because of the inadequate trend analysis mentioned above. Warmer conditions could have averted the disaster. Desire to launch prevailed. With respect to Columbia, because the impact seemed more significant than the many previous instances of foam striking the orbiter, NASA engineers reviewing launch videos were alarmed. They requested a damage assessment but were overridden by management without a hearing. Had management honored the request, the disaster might have been prevented the crew rescued but the orbiter lost. A healthy organization provides an environment and information conducive to decisions that advance the organization's goals within ethical constraints. Clearly, pressure to launch biased decisions by overemphasizing the partial, short-term goal of launching on schedule, rified in a lack of substantive, ethical discussion preceding the fatal no-return decisions. Astronauts, those most at risk, were not represented in the discussions. As the official reports reveal, typical pre-decision discussions were formal and procedural and laden with acronyms, emphasized the need to launch, and lacked ethical substance. 